We are very delighted to have with us three distinguished speakers. One of them couldn't be with us, so he will join us through uh, FaceTime. So uh, he is on, he is connected now. So Dr. Chaha will introduce him at the proper moment. Dr. Omar Chaha is our moderator. Dr. Chaha is professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Istanbul Zaire University here. His areas of research include women's movement, political theory, and theory of democracy. Dr. Chaha has many books and publications in English and Turkish, including Women and Civil Society in Turkey, Women's Movements in Muslim Society, Glass Ceiling Syndrome in Turkey, Political Ideologies in Turkey and the World, Women in Changing World, and many, many, many other books. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Chaha also co-edited several volumes, including Family in the World and in Turkey, and Process of EU Enlargement in the 21st Century, New Challenges. Please welcome Dr. Omar Chaha. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very great pleasure for me to open the of this important conference. Uh, the title of this uh, session is The Future Prospects of the Palestinian Congress, Legal, Political, and International Perspectives. We have three distinguished speakers. One of them will not be able to be with us, unfortunately, and he will connect to Skype. So I would like to present uh, uh, the speakers. The first speaker uh, is Professor uh, John. Right. He is a professor emeritus at the Morris College of Law of the Ohio University in Columbus. He is a specialist in public international law and the law of human rights. He writes extensively on legal issues related to the Palestinian question. His books uh, cover key issues in the conflict over the Palestine and includes the following. International diplomacy of Israel's founders. Deception at the United Nations in the quest of Palestine. The Six-Day War and Israeli Self-Defense. <laughs> Questioning the legal basis for preventive war, the status of Palestine, international law in the Middle East conflict, and the case for Palestine, an international law perspective. The title of uh, Professor Kulikley's presentation is Framing the Conflict from the Perspective of International Law. So the second distinguished speaker is Dr. Moin Rabani. He is an independent analyst, commentator and researcher specializing in Palestinian affairs and the Arab-Israel conflict. He has previously served as the principal political affairs officer with the Office of the United Nations Special Envoy for Syria, head of Middle East with Crisis Management, Management Initiative Center, Senior Middle East Analyst and Special Advisor on Israel-Palestine with the International Crisis Group. Rabbani is also co-editor of Jadaliya, contributing editor of Middle East Report, Senior Fellow with the Institute for Palestine Studies, Associate Fellow of the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Policy Advisor to Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. <coughs> He's a graduate of Tufts University and Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. The title of uh, Dr. Rabban's presentation is Trump and Palestine, Continuity and Change in the U.S. Policy. And the third distinguished speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Norman Finkelstein. He is a political scientist and scholar of the Middle East who focuses on the question of Israel-Palestine. Dr. Finkelstein receives his PhD from Princeton University in 1988 
and he is the author of ten books that have been translated into many different languages, uh, including the Holocaust industry, reflections on the exploitation of Jewish suffering, and most recently, Gaza, and inquest into the, uh, its military zone. He has had faculty positions at Brooklyn, Brooklyn College, Rutgers University, Hunter College, New York University, and DePaul University, where he was an assistant professor from 2001-2007. The title of uh, Dr. Uh, Franklin's uh, uh, presentation is the future of Gaza and the occupation, what happens next. As I said, he will not be able to, uh, to participate uh, here, but he will uh, connect through Skype. Oh, he's actually here. Oh, you're welcome. Dr. Franklin, I hope you are okay. I'm fine. Nice to meet you. Uh, okay, so I think he was the, the third speaker. So we are now to, to start with Professor John Quigley. The floor is yours. We have about 20, 23 minutes. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is this audible in back? Is this good? Yeah. Um, I, at this point, I think we have something of a dilemma because we heard from Dr. Ilan Pape, uh, who said that international law has nothing to say about settler colonialism. Um, yet this morning we heard from our theologians, and if you listen carefully, uh, they mentioned justice and they mentioned international law as something incorporated within their their theologies. Um, so we have to figure out uh, whether there's truth to what Dr. Pape said, truth to what the theologians said. Um, uh, and and as, as you'll, you'll see, my answer, uh, perhaps a diplomatic answer, is if there's some truth to both uh, uh, perspectives on the matter. It, it's an issue that, as I was thinking about this, reminded me of discussions I had with Edward Said on the same subject. Edward was very skeptical about international law, whether the institutions of international law would provide a, a solution uh, for Palestine. Um, but at the same time, whenever I would talk with him about different processes that were going on, he was always very interested. Um, so I think he had uh, perhaps a, uh, an ambivalent view of, of the matter. Um, but on settler colonialism, I, I think there are some places where you see international law dealing with the subject. And you do have the uh, International Convention on the Crime of Apartheid uh, that was adopted in response to the situation in, in South Africa. Um, and at that same historical period, uh, you had the Security Council of the United Nations dealing uh, with the Unilateral Declaration of Independence in Rhodesia, where you had a, uh, a European settler minority uh, group that was declaring independence from Britain uh, with the premise that they would have a state in which only the settlers were represented and which only the settlers would have the right to vote. And the Security Council responded to that with a set of, of very significant economic sanctions that were they maintained for a period of years. So, so I do think there is some precedent in United Nations practice uh, for dealing with, with settler colonialism. Um, at the same time, uh, Palestine has not been treated well by the international institutions. Uh, uh, if you want to go back to the Balfour Declaration, uh, and its incorporation into the Palestine Mandate, which was a, a, a clear infringement on self-determination of the population uh, of Palestine. Uh, you had the British government entering into that process uh, for reasons of its own, issuing the Balfour Declaration for reasons that fundamentally were, were related to trying to win the, the war against Germany uh, and has nothing to do with the uh, the situation in Palestine in the sense of, of being good or bad, uh, uh, that was a matter of indifference, I think, to the British government. Uh, uh, and the British government then uh, had to make, uh, um, it, it's, uh, uh, make itself uh, accountable to the League of Nations, which 
devise the system of mandates for, for Palestine, for, for Iraq, and, and for Syria. Um, uh, and in that process, the British government, um, uh, you know, committed prevarication, I'll say, to say it politely, uh, for a period of years, trying to convince the Permanent Mandates Commission that the situation in Palestine was, was, was going well, that the two population groups could get along, that Jewish immigration could be uh, accommodated without uh, any problems, uh, even though the British government knew, knew quite well uh, that, that, that that was not the case. And there, there's, there's good documentation uh, on the proposition that it knew quite well that it was not going to be able to resolve the, uh, the conflict, namely that the continued migration uh, was going to, to, to lead to a, a, an untenable situation, which Britain finally acknowledged publicly in, in 1937. Um, but then, you know, going forward uh, to 1947 and, and 1948, uh, you had the, the United Nations at that point uh, uh, entering into the issue uh, and adopting a resolution uh, to partition Palestine. Uh, then you had the Nakba, uh, and the United Nations more or less sat silent as the Nakba occurred. Uh, and it was not that they were not being told what was going on. Um, if you read the transcripts of Security Council meetings for 1948, and I would advise anyone interested to do so, they're all available uh, on, on the UN website, um, you'll see that the Arab Higher Committee was uh, persistently pressing the point that the Arabs were being expelled from Palestine. Uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Henri Catan, who was the uh, a lawyer, one of the lawyers representing the Arab Higher Committee, uh, you'll find his name in those records. Uh, he made uh, an especially uh, strong uh, point when there was an atrocity committed in the village of Dawaima in October of 1948, uh, when um, the elements of, of what by then was called the Israel Defense Force went into the town, uh, gathered men in the mosque, and, and killed a large number of them. Um, uh, and it was actually, I think, the Syrian delegate that brought that before the Security Council. Uh, and the response came from Abba Iban, who was representing Israel at that point. Uh, and, uh, Unfortunately, the Syrian delegate had made a mistake in, in what he submitted and uh, had misidentified the location of Dawaima. He said it was north of Jerusalem rather than south uh, of Jerusalem, which is where it is, uh, near, near al Um uh, And Abba Iban said, ah, here you find the Arabs lying again. They're saying that there was an atrocity in a village and there's no such village north of Jerusalem by that name. Uh, uh, and uh, eventually the, the, that was cleared up, uh, but, but the, um, the Security Council never dealt with, with that uh, and never did more in, in the year 1948 than to call for a ceasefire. Uh, it never called the, uh, the, uh, the IDF uh, or the, the predecessors of the IDF in the period b before May, uh, never called them on, on the expulsion <laughs> Uh, that was going on. Uh, the General Assembly did deal with the matter uh, in December of 1948 in Resolution 194 calling for the repatriation. So it, it, it did do that much, uh, but uh, it, it didn't say why that had occurred. Um, uh, but um, then if you move to 1956, you, you do find the United Nations doing uh, a, a bit better uh, with the invasion of the tripartite invasion of Egypt by France and Britain and Israel. Uh, that was uh, dealt with first in the Security Council where resolutions were proposed to condemn France and Britain uh, and Israel. Uh, and they were vetoed by France and Britain as permanent members of the Security Council. But then the matter went to the General Assembly where there was similar condemnation uh, that did eventually lead to a, a, a Israeli uh, withdrawal. Um, but going ahead to 1967, it, it, it gets very bad again uh, because the Security Council didn't deal with the fact that Israel committed aggression in 1967. 
um, uh, even though it was well known in particular to the United States that the action had been one uh, of Israeli aggression because the Israeli government had for several weeks prior to June 5th of 1967 been lobbying the U.S. government for permission to invade Egypt. Uh, and so when the invasion did come, the United States was, was quite aware uh, that it was undertaken by, by Israel uh, without there being any uh, expectation that Egypt was going to attack. The CIA was keeping fairly good tabs on the situation, and the U.S. government kept telling Abba Iban uh, that Egypt was not going to attack. Um, but uh, finally, you know, uh, as you know, the uh, IDF did attack. Um, uh, and when that then came before the Security Council, uh, the United Nations uh, had extensive discussion of the matter, both in the Security Council and in the, the General Assembly. Um, there were resolutions proposed by the Soviet delegate to condemn Israel for aggression, and those didn't go anywhere. And the United States, even though it well knew that Israel had committed aggression, kept silent. Uh, Ambassador Goldberg spoke with the Israeli representatives, and you know uh, this is recorded in, in some of the memoirs, uh, and asked them what, what he could do to help. Uh, uh, and basically they said, you know, just keep your mouth shut, uh, and, and that's what Ambassador Goldberg did. Um, uh, so uh, if you look at those records, and these records are very interesting, the Security Council in, in June of 1967 and the General Assembly, which held a special session on the matter, uh, also in June of 1967, you will not find a single representative saying that Israel acted lawfully in that war. You will not find a single one, including the United States. The United States, as I say, kept quiet on the matter uh, and diverted the discussion to saying, well, we shouldn't really get into the question of who started the war. Uh, we should talk about an overall solution of the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, which led, unfortunately, to Resolution 242 uh, in November of 1967. Uh, a resolution that did not call for Israeli uh, withdrawal uh, as a self-standing uh, uh, matter. Um, so um, I know those records are very interesting because if you look at what Abba, it was again Abba Iban uh, uh, who represented Israel in both the General Assembly and the Security Council, uh, and when the um, uh, invasion took off and, and then was discussed in the Security Council, uh, he claimed that the Egyptians had started the fighting, uh, which, which didn't make much sense because of the overwhelming Israeli force that was being brought to bear against Egypt. But uh, in any event, he said that the Egyptians had, uh, had shelled three villages in southern Israel. Uh, and, and this was the story that the Israeli government gave uh, to the, uh, the, the premier of, of the Soviet Union and to Lyndon Johnson in two letters that were written and sent on the morning of June 5th, 1967. And these letters, uh, each one says that Egypt shelled three villages that morning and that that precipitated an Israeli uh, a counter response. Uh, uh, they, they, did, they wrote up these letters so fast, if you look at them, you'll find that it's not the same three villages that are named in the two letters. So there's one letter to the to, uh, Premier Kasig in, in Russia that names three villages, another to Lyndon Johnson that names three villages. And they got, for two of the villages, they have the same names, and for the third, it, they're different villages. So uh, this was a reflection of the fact that they had made this story up uh, only within the, the previous 24 hours, because their, their original uh, um, story that they were going to give for attacking Egypt uh, was that Egypt had attacked first, uh, uh, namely an attack on an Israeli vessel going through the Straits of Tehran. They had a plan uh, because Lyndon Johnson kept telling them, don't fire the first shot, don't fire the first shot. So they came up with a plan which they actually ran by the U.S. government to see whether it would wash. Uh, uh, and the plan was that they were going to send a vessel through the Straits of Tehran expecting the Egyptian uh, artillery to fire on it 
and then they would say, aha, Egypt has fired, and now we have a uh, launch a, a full invasion. Um, they actually had a vessel that was, was uh, uh, came from the Israeli uh, transport agency, Zim, that um, uh, they, they called the Dolphin, uh, and they had it all ready with about 60 Israeli military people pretending to be commercial sailors on this vessel in the east coast of Africa, in, in a port uh, uh, opposite the, the Straits of Tehran, uh, waiting orders to sail into the Straits of Tehran. And this is, I'm now talking June, June 1 or June 2nd. Uh, uh, the plan ultimately was squelched by Moshe Dayan, who was afraid that the Egyptians would be smart enough not to shoot, and then uh, the plan, plan wouldn't work. So, so that left Abba Ibn having to come up with a fake explanation uh, within about a 24-hour period. Uh, but in any event, that that is really, uh, and not just a historically significant uh, um, episode, but it's continuing to be important. If you look at what uh, Ehud Barak said during the Camp David 2000 as to why Israel wouldn't withdraw, and he was pressed by the, the Palestinian side for a withdrawal from, from Gaza in the West Bank, he said, well, we took it in self-defense. Um, if you look at those records, Israel did not argue self-defense even. That was something that, that was invented after the fact, after it became obvious that the Egyptians had not, in fact, fired on, on the morning of June 5th. Uh, so it, it was a backup uh, uh, justification, you might say. Uh, but um, in, in any event, uh, you know, to, to, move, to move forward uh, quickly, the um, uh, the, the matter got into a negotiation phase in the 1990s um, uh, when the, with the Oslo Agreement, uh, and, and that ultimately led, well, finally in 1999 to actual uh, negotiations, um, which, as you know, have not gone anywhere. Um, uh, but these were very difficult. Uh, I was asked to be a consultant in those negotiations to, to the Palestinian side. Uh, and and uh, it was organized actually by the British government to, to have a, a, a legal team that would advise the, the Palestinian side uh, because the Israelis had a big uh, a raft of lawyers in their foreign ministry and, and the Palestinian side uh, didn't. Um, uh, so I got involved in that uh, uh, and got uh, uh, into being responsible for the refugee question, which we, we can talk about later. Uh, but um, I do want to move forward because I, I want to indicate just briefly some of the things in international law uh, that, that are, uh, are, are going on now. Um, uh, one is that the... Uh, Tell you about it. The, the uh, UN Conference on Trade and Development um, has decided to write up a, uh, an, extensive, an extensive paper on the question of the economic costs of the Israeli occupation uh, of, of, uh, of Palestine territory, uh, which, it, which it did last year, uh, and as a way of setting a, a, the stage uh, ultimately, and this may never come to fruition, but setting the stage. Uh, for uh, compensation to be paid for uh, for the damage caused by the, the occupation. Uh, uh, and uh, apart from that, simply to, you know, to make the point that the, the, uh, uh, the occupation has caused significant damage, uh, not only by direct Israeli action, uh, but also in preventing development. This paper has a, uh, has a section on, on the human rights of development and argues that, that Israel has, has impeded the, uh, the right to uh, development. Um, this is uh, kind of done from a, a legal dimension. I, I helped draft this paper for the Perot side, uh, and it, it refers to the, uh, uh, the various legal uh, provisions that are being violated by Israel. Uh, and this is the title of the, uh, of the document, which is from the UN Conference on Trade and Development. It was actually requested by the General Assembly. So the General Assembly asked uh, UNCTAD to undertake this project. 
uh, and it, it, uh, it publishes. You can just, you can Google economic costs of Israeli occupation uh, and, uh, and and get that. But some of the uh, other things that are uh, are are going on. Uh, one is that um, uh, the uh, uh, the government of Palestine has sued the United States and the International Court of Justice over the relocation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the embassy to uh, Jerusalem that was just filed recently, and it, it's a case that's likely to go on for, uh, for some time. Um, the other is that there is uh, uh, activity in the International Criminal Court, which may be of more interest to non-governmental organizations since Non-governmental organizations uh, really have access to the International uh, Criminal Court, whereas they don't have access to the International Court of Justice. Uh, but the um, uh, International Criminal Court uh, is seized of a, uh, what they call a preliminary examination uh, with respect to Palestine uh, relating to the settlements in the West Bank and relating to the uh, uh, the 2014 war. Uh, so that's going on there. Uh, as well, there's a, a current case involving the Gaza flotilla uh, before the International Criminal Court, uh, which has been in process now for a number of years because the, the, the prosecutor has decided that while what was done by the, uh, by the Israeli Navy was a war crime, uh, and she says that very clearly, that what they did on the Mavi Marmara, the killing of the, of the persons on the Mavi Marmara, was a war crime uh, committed in a state of, of belligerent occupation because of the belligerent occupation of Gaza, uh, and, uh, and that it involved an attack on civilians by, by a military force. Um, but she said, nonetheless, she wasn't going to uh, investigate it fully uh, because it was not something that she found to have been planned by the Israeli government. The, the court itself has some oversight on the prosecutor, and they've been fighting back and forth now for about two years, uh, with the court telling her, we think this is significant enough that you should be uh, investigating it. Uh, and she says back to them, well, I, I'm looking at it again, and I don't think I should have to. There's going to be an oral argument about this in The Hague uh, on, uh, on Wednesday morning of, of this week. In fact, I think it's going to be live streamed. Uh, if you go on, the, on this uh, website, International Criminal Court, um, uh, that, that will be taking place on Wednesday morning. Uh, and the, the judges are really criticizing her uh, because she took the episode on the vessel in isolation. Uh, apart from the context, apart from the blockade of Gaza, uh, and apart from how it was that the uh, Israeli Navy got onto the vessel in the first place. Uh, she accepted what you may have seen, uh, it's called the Palmer Report that was done, uh, that said that it was not a violation of international law for Israel to to board the, the Mavi Marmara 70 miles out to sea on the high seas. A uh, rather absurd conclusion, and the Human Rights Council of the UN actually appointed an inquiry group which said that it was a violation uh, of international law. So the judges are saying, when you, you look at the entire situation, uh, it's much more serious than just what happened on, on the rest of the In any event, that's going to be argued on, uh, on Wednesday morning. Um, uh, but I just wanted to mention those as some of the, the, the current uh, uh, matters that are being dealt with uh, through international institutions. Uh, actually, next week, the Security Council is going to have an informal session about the settlements um, uh, called, uh, a session being called by the Ambassador of Indonesia. Uh, uh, and I, I'm going to be presenting a, 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 a short uh, talk at the Security Council uh, on that subject, along with several other you know, persons that they've, they've uh, uh, asked to come as experts to, to talk about the legality of, of Israel's settlements and, and the consequences uh, of, of the settlements. But uh, I will stop at that point, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, <laughs>
Thank you so much, Professor Quigley. And now the floor is uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Rabali. You have uh, 23 minutes. Thank you very much. Just for the purpose of clarification, I don't have a doctorate. Um, no. All right. So, whether uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Siga and Dr. Sani for for organizing uh, this conference. Whether it matters domestic or foreign, it is fashionable to characterize President Trump as the, as the disruptor in chief. This has been no less true of current U.S. policy towards Palestine. Among the measures adopted by the Trump administration that were carefully avoided by its Republican and Democrat predecessors alike are the following. The Trump administration has effectively abandoned endorsement of Palestinian statehood, a position that became official U.S. policy during the administration of George W. Bush. The Trump administration has terminated the USAID program in the occupied Palestinian territories that commenced during the Clinton administration. None of this aid went to the Palestinian Authority or to its budget. Tellingly, the only form of direct US assistance to the PA, consisting of various forms of open and covert support to the Palestinian security forces, remains untouched. The Trump administration has ordered the closure of the PLO mission to the United States and expels its diplomats, effectively severing diplomatic relations with the Palestinians, and in so doing, reversing a policy first adopted during the final days of the Reagan administration. The Trump administration has recognized Israel's annexation of the occupied Syrian Golan Heights, an act rejected as null and void by the Reagan administration. The Trump administration has formally ended the characterization of the West Bank and Gaza Strip as occupied territories, reversing the formal position of every U.S. administration since Israel first conquered these territories in 1967 during the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. The Trump administration has terminated U.S. funding to and called for the abolition of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees. This despite the fact that the U.S. played a central role in establishing this agency and its mandate during the Truman and Eisenhower administrations, and has for many years been its single largest funder. The target of this initiative is not so much UNRWA, but rather the Palestine refugee question itself. The Trump administration hopes to liquidate this issue by compelling the United Nations to redefine Palestine refugees so that they effectively cease to exist. The Trump administration has reversed 70 years of U.S. policy, first adopted by the Truman administration, and recognized Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. Washington has, for all intents and purposes, extended this to a recognition of exclusive Israeli sovereignty over both West and occupied East Jerusalem, and has additionally begun the process of relocating the U.S. Embassy to Israel from Tel Aviv to the Holy City. The Trump administration has ordered the closure of the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem, which was opened in 1844 during the administration of John Tyler. U.S. relations with the Palestinians, such as they are, are currently conducted from the premises of the U.S. Embassy to Israel as a subsidiary of the U.S.-Israel relationship. For those of you unfamiliar with Tyler, he was the first vice president to assume the presidency on account of the death of his predecessor, and was therefore popularly known as his accidency. Because the U.S. laws of succession were at the time unclear, a cloud of illegitimacy hovered over his tenure. Another predecessor, John Quincy Adams, described Tyler as a man with talents not above mediocrity and a spirit incapable of expansion to the dimensions of the station on which he has been cast by the hand of providence." End quote. Tyler was considered out of step with the Whig party he represented, which expelled him from its ranks, and all but one of his cabinet members resigned during his tenure. Whether his failure to secure re-election is an additional resonance from the past, we shall soon find out. And additionally, the Trump administration 
has introduced a policy announced by its chief Bulgarian, former U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, of vetoing the nomination of any Palestinian to a senior position in the United Nations. Given that such officials are nominated by the UN bureaucracy in their individual capacity, rather than by or as representatives of the PLO or PA, this can only be characterized as an explicitly racist policy. Many of these policy changes additionally represent a clean break with the international consensus on the question of Palestine, and as in the case of the relocation of the U.S. Embassy, also stand in explicit violation of UN Security Council resolutions, resolutions that by definition could only have been passed with U.S. consent. <coughs> Excuse me. The appearance is clearly one of a willful, radical departure from traditional U.S. policy, and in form, it certainly is. But upon closer examination, there is a case to be made that Trump is building upon a long-standing bipartisan consensus and merely taking it to its logical conclusion. To denounce Trump and his government for seeking to consign the Palestinian people and their struggle for self-determination to the trash bin of history is, of course, entirely appropriate. But the administration's actions over the past two years hardly constitute a comprehensive reversal of U.S. policy. While previous Republican and Democrat administrations have generally avoided the shock jock approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict currently in vogue in the White House, we are not in uncharted waters. Take, for example, the U.S. recognition of Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. Trump was hardly the first U.S. presidential candidate to pledge that he would do what he eventually did. For decades, every significant Republican and Democrat candidate has made exactly the same pledge. More to the point, the basis for this initiative was established by the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995, which was adopted by a resounding vote of 93 to 5 in the Senate and 374 to 37 in the House of Representatives. The act allowed the president to sign a waiver every six months postponing implementation on national security grounds, and all Trump did last year was decline to sign a further waiver. In other words, there was no new legislation involved. Similarly, the closure of the Palestinian mission in the United States is based on the 1987 Anti-Terrorism Act, which defines the PLO as a terrorist organization and a threat to the United States, its allies, and international law, and prohibits the PLO from establishing or maintaining an office within the jurisdiction of the United States. Introduced by Senator Charles Grassley, the act enjoyed no less than 48 co-sponsors from every conceivable side of the aisle, comprising nearly half the Senate. Here again, Trump merely refused to issue a six-monthly monthly certification exempting the PLO from the provisions of the, of the act that otherwise remained in full force. On the refugee question, Washington's political class has for decades had one line in its sights. The volume of deliberate misinformation on this particular issue has been nothing short of overwhelming. UNRWA, for example, was established by the UN General Assembly in 1949 to provide relief for refugees uprooted as a result of the 1948 war. And it continues to exist for the simple reason that, seven decades on, the Palestinians remain a dispossessed and stateless people. UNRWA is not the custodian of Palestinian refugee rights, and there is nothing unusual in either international law or international practice in defining the descendants of refugees as refugees in the absence of conflict resolution. In this context, the Trump administration's efforts to produce the so-called deal of the century build upon and extend at least as much as they contradict the positions established by his predecessors during the Bush Sr., Clinton, Bush Jr., and Obama administrations. The distance between Dennis Ross and Jared Kushner is hardly an unbridgeable chasm. There are also clear continuities on other sides of the equation, and these help explain the evolution of U.S. policy. Here it is useful to think of several interrelated dynamics that tend to mutually reinforce each other, Israeli, Palestinian, American, and regional international. 
With respect to the Israeli dynamics, there has been an important shift over the course of the past decade, one in which the divide in the Israeli political spectrum was between those who advocated an indefinite perpetuation of the status quo or creeping annexation as the best way to ensure Israel's interest in the occupied territories versus those proposing some form of territorial compromise, primarily with Jordan, but more recently with the Palestinians. Today, the divide is between those advocating an indefinite perpetuation of the status quo versus those promoting formal annexation. This transition from creeping to weeping annexation has developed over time and is now immeasurably empowered by the Trump administration. Its open embrace of the most extreme elements of the Israeli political spectrum and adoption of their agenda as its own have served to push the Israeli center even further towards the right. The various US measures I outlined earlier have transformed the prospects of annexing the West Bank from a reckless ambition to a realistic opportunity. Israel's growing army of annexationists, quite rightly, see the period between the recent Israeli parliamentary elections and the upcoming American presidential election as a golden opportunity that may not be repeated during their lifetimes. With respect to Palestinian dynamics, this has been addressed by several other speakers, so I will limit myself to observing that the fragmentation and disintegration of the national movement and the leadership's continued fealty to Oslo have emboldened and empowered Israel and the United States in their dealings with the Palestinians and encouraged them to adopt increasingly extreme policies and demands. I have a section on uh, regional polarization, but in the interest of time, I'll skip it over, but uh, we'll be happy to discuss it during the discussion session. Um, and I'll now turn to Oslo. It was, in fact, a quarter century ago, on account of the Oslo process, that the seeds of the most recent developments were planted. Often mistaken as a blueprint for a two-state settlement, Oslo was above all a formula whereby Israel was able to consolidate and perpetuate its occupation as by design rather than as a result of the failure of the process. Oslo did so by subcontracting essential civil and security functions to the Palestinians and by insulating itself from meaningful international scrutiny through the mechanism of permanent negotiations, which, again as a matter of design, consistently failed to resolve or even address the core issues of the conflict. And it was above all thanks to American hegemony in regulating the Israeli-Palestinian relationship that the international consensus on the resolution of the conflict was replaced by Israeli power and impunity in exercising it. Seen from this perspective, seen from this perspective the Oslo agreements should be seen not as a failure, but as an enormous success not for peace or for Palestinian rights, but for continued Israeli control of the occupied territories. So successful that Palestinians, virtually without exception, today consider themselves significantly further removed from the fulfillment of their national aspirations than on the eve of the process. While the Trump administration has, as with most issues, opted for a disruptive approach toward the question of Palestine, there is an underlying logic to the belief that 25 years of Oslo have made Palestinians right for the ultimate fait accompli. Rather than wait for the Trump administration to present a diplomatic plan and invite the parties to negotiate terms, we would do well to recognize that the initiative already exists and is already being implemented unilaterally before our very eyes. Those waiting for Washington to unveil a coherent diplomatic initiative or in my view, waiting in vain. If there was even the outline of a plan, it would, like everything else with this administration, have leaked by now. The current administration is inverting the traditional U.S. approach. Implement first, then perhaps publish. In this respect, I would expect a revival of the quality of life agenda pursued by Israel during the 1980s, in which economic incentives substitute for political rights. This time it is likely to come with a generous serving of annexation. Many have observed that Netanyahu would not have raised the issue of annexation during the recent election campaign if he did not believe he had U.S. support for doing so. 
This trajectory would not necessarily lead to the termination of the two-state settlement paradigm, but rather an Israeli-American attempt to reconfigure it. A Palestinian entity based in the Gaza Strip with isolated self-governing outposts in the West Bank and the functional extension into, into the Al-Adish region of the Sinai Peninsula, and, on the other hand, an Israeli state incorporating much, most, and perhaps eventually all of the West Bank. This would be broadly consistent with what has already been implemented at Plan Kushner and would help explain Secretary of State Pompeo's recent refusal to express even the slightest concern at the prospect of annexation. Israel has many annexationist options. It is, at least initially, likely to focus on Area C, which, although comprising some 60% of the West Bank, would leave the great majority of West Bank Palestinians and Gaza Strip Palestinians under Palestinian rather than Israeli authority. If Israel indeed proceeds in this direction, it would be difficult, and I would argue politically untenable, for Palestinians or the international community to demand more extensive Israel, Israeli annexation and conferral of Israeli citizenship on West Bank Palestinians. There are, in any case, various formulas through which Israel can seek to incorporate maximum territory with minimal errors. Should this indeed come to pass, it would in many respects form the logical culmination of over half a century of Israeli occupation. Mix one measure of creeping annexation, add several helpings of Israeli impunity, and top it off with generous amounts of American indulgence and empty European posturing, and this is precisely what you get. I would similarly argue that Trump's policies on the question of Palestine also did not emerge from a vacuum, but rather built on various precedents adopted by Congress and previous US administrations. <coughs> We now have a situation in which, one, the U.S. President is already making support for Israel a cornerstone of his partisan warfare with the Democrats and his upcoming re-election campaign. Second, key members of Trump's national security team and a significant proportion of his base openly proclaim that Trump was installed in the White House by none other than God in order to serve Israel. Three. U.S. efforts to resolve the question of Palestine are led by an inspector Cousseau who fancies himself Detective Poirot, if not the reincarnation of Metternich, and who, along with his two aides, have for decades been invested in Israel's settlement project. You may recall that during his first visit to the White House, Netanyahu fondly reminisced about sleeping in Jared Kushner's bed. Yet, what do we mean with sweeping statements that Israel's election results have put paid to the two-state paradigm. To at least this Palestinian year, it sounds like a clarion call, however inadvertently, for permanent occupation and acquiescence in annexation. Rather, it is precisely at this critical historical juncture that we must hold fast to the international consensus and international law. Given the current desultory state of the Palestinian national movement, Palestinians possess little more than what the late Edward Said termed the power of refusal. This means, first and foremost, categorically refusing to lie in the same bed in which Netanyahu slept so comfortably, and refusing to engage in futile efforts to avoid blame for Plan Kushner's stillbirth. Absent Palestinian consent, it will be virtually impossible for even Israel and America's closest regional allies to formally engage with their designs. It is important to note that there is also a broader agenda at play, and one in which the question of Palestine is a means to achieve a larger end as much as it is an objective itself. Best exemplified by National Security Advisor John Bolton, this broader agenda consists of degrading the international system and its institutions eliminating international law and international accountability from the rule book, and making U.S. power the sole arbiter of international affairs. The reason the question of Palestine has been chosen by the Trump administration as a battering ram of choice to dismantle the international order is because support for Israel, as in recent decades, 
enjoyed levels of bipartisan support other U.S. allies can only dream of. Yet the negative response to Netanyahu's re-election by some prominent Democrats who have been traditionally silent when it comes to Palestinian rights is a potentially positive sign. These dangers may also present an opportunity. Palestinians are in a position to make their cause a litmus test for the survival and integrity of the international system, particularly if Israel proceeds with acts of annexation, and particularly if it does so with U.S. support. Thus far, the U.S. has conferred recognition on Israeli acts of annexation that are several decades old. In the case of the West Bank, Israel would have to act first and could face significant international consequences for doing so. That said, it is important to note that change does not self-generate and will require intensive and extensive effort. Thank you. The Palestinians will first have to put their house in order along the lines proposed by several speakers over the past several days here. Salvation is not going to come from the Arab world, third world, or Europe. But if the Palestinians act first and act strategically, they can mobilize all of the above. If they act wisely and properly, they will have many willing and even some unwilling allies. I will conclude with a brief observation about the justice of the Palestinian cause. As many speakers here have noted, our cause is just. Yet the justice of a cause is a poor indicator of its outcome. If causes triumph simply because they are just, we would live in a very different world than that which we inhabit today. And just causes are, in fact, routinely defeated. Victory, rather, requires a complex combination of factors, and we must work ceaselessly to at least turn those within our power to influence to our advantage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abani. And now we are to give the floor to Dr. Norman Finkelstein. I don't know if it is ready or not. Uh, hello. Hello, Mr. Finkelstein. How are you? I'm fine. Can you hear me clearly? Uh, thank you so much. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes. 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 Well, first of all, thank you for having me and having listened very carefully to the first two presentations. I genuinely regret uh, not having been there <coughs> in person uh, because I found the presentations both uh, accurate and also bearing on topics that I have been exploring. Uh, I was quite surprised that Professor Quigley is familiar with the Mavi Marmara case in the International Criminal Court because basically it's been a very well-kept secret. Uh, I myself am working on that case right now and my desk is cluttered with literally thousands of pages uh, bearing on the case. Uh, and I think it's an important one, because I think it may culminate in Israel's, if not indictment, at least investigation by the Internet. It's too complex to look at right now, but it's an important development, and it's to Professor Quigley's credit that he apparently is familiar with the details. Um, Professor... Uh, I should say, uh, Mui Rabani's presentation was really excellent. I'd have to say it's a tour de force. It was uh, first rate. It happens that a lot of what he said intersects or overlaps with what I will have to say now. And my point of departure is actually some remarks that uh, Mui made a few months ago, and which he repeated it, well, it's morning for me, I guess it's afternoon for you. So let me begin. 
I always pay close attention to what Malik says because I think he is the best uh, analyst of what's going on in the Middle East in general and of Israel-Palestine in particular. And a few months ago, Moeen dismissed the idea of a, a Kushner, a Jared Kushner uh, Phoenix plan uh, because he said, well, there haven't been any leaks. And if there haven't been any leaks, that's an indication that there's no plan. I happen to be of the opinion, but I don't think it's a big difference with Moeen. I do think there is a plan now. Uh, because certain factors have, in the course of time, the past year, they have ripened, or unexpected factors have come into play, which means now is the right moment to launch a plan. Number one, and this is one factor that Moeen, for reasons of time, apparently didn't have a chance to go into, there is the Saudi road. Uh, the defeat that the Saudis suffered in Syria and in Yemen, and then the unexpected disaster of the Khashoggi affair, have now made Saudi Arabia more intent on trying to sow an alliance with Israel and the United States. In the case of Israel, there was the electoral victory by Mr. Netanyahu, which means he now has a freer hand to sign an agreement. The Palestinian Authority is now facing a major financial crisis, and so will be more desperate to get money in exchange for some sort of agreement. Hamas, unfortunately, was not able to turn the Great March of Return into a political uh, or diplomatic victory of any kind, basically because they received no international support, whether by states, whether by international or uh, institutions, or in particular, they received, or the Great March of Return, received no support from the International Solidarity Movement, which wholly ignored the Great March of Return and instead focused obsessively, in my opinion, on BDS. And the U.S. now does need to show something for the claim that's been ballyhooed the past four years of the deal of the century before Americans go to the polls in 2020. So it seems as if all the main players, the Saudis, Israel, the PA, Hamas, and the US, they all have a stake in some sort of plan. What will the plan look like? Uh, I'll just fill in some of the details, but I think Wien has already outlined it. It will be an updated version of Ariel Sharon's Gaza disengagement, which means it will be Gaza for the West Bank. Gaza will experience a partial lifting of the blockade, and an economic rehabilitation financed by the Saudis. The quid pro quo will be Israel's annexation of the major settlement blocks, about 9.5% of the West Bank, on what's called the Israeli side of the wall. It will also be offered an economic rehabilitation uh, to be financed by the Saudis again. Israel will maintain the security border along the Jordan River, and the West Bankers will be granted some kind of self-rule with future political options left open. In addition, they will get, that will be the carrot, uh, 
stomach rehabilitation, or, or in some, it will be a version of what's called, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has called it, the economic peace in the West Bank. That is some form of quote-unquote economic prosperity in exchange for <clears throat> uh, any political uh, gains by the Palestinians. Now the question is, are there sufficient political forces that can realize that plan? It appears that Moeen is skeptical that such political forces exist. And here I would respectfully dissent, though it's a matter of speculation, I acknowledge. What's Israel's gain? Israel, first of all, is currently under the leadership of Netanyahu. And Netanyahu is, first and foremost, a politician. He doesn't really have a strategic vision. He tries to exploit the political moment. And there are many instances I can cite of his trying to exploit a political moment. And sometimes even, he does not exploit a political moment if he calculates there is advantage in ignoring it. So, for example, about a week before the election in Israel, there was an accidental or an unintended Hamas rocket attack on Israel, and everybody wondered whether this would be the prelude to a new invasion. And the mistake I thought at the time was, people think that Israel actually reacts to quote unquote security threats. It does not. Israel reacts on the basis of political calculation. And Netanyahu recognized that if you launch an invasion, the outcome was very unpredictable. And therefore, given that the election would be close between him and Mr. Gantz, he decided not to launch the attack, not to take a political advantage of it, because it might jeopardize his electoral victory. So Mr. Netanyahu is a politician, somebody who's always calculating political advantage. And as Moeen, in my opinion, correctly pointed out, he realizes that the Trump administration in general, and in particular between now and 2020, uh, it's a godsend. The Trump administration has basically, under the leadership or at the behest of the Israeli government, tried to resolve all of what are called the final status issues of the Israel-Palestine conflict unilaterally. So, as Moeen pointed out, they attempted to defund UNRWA to resolve the refugee question. They acknowledged the Israeli occupation of Jerusalem, the Golan, effectively ending the Jerusalem question. And if the U.S. lends its approval to the annexation of the settlement blocks, then the last two of what are called the final status issues, namely borders and settlements, would be resolved. So it's a huge opportunity, or at least it's conceived a huge opportunity, to try to do an end run around the international consensus by the Trump administration unilaterally resolving the four final status issues, namely the refugees, Jerusalem, the borders, and the settlements. The other very big uh, appeal for Netanyahu of such a Kushner plan would be, and here we didn't go into the point, but I suspect he would have if time allowed, it will allow for an unprecedented open alliance with the Saudis. 
having Israel its biggest diplomatic victory since the Egyptian defection at Camp David in 1978. So, given Netanyahu's uh, disposition as a politician above all, the possibility of unilaterally resolving in Israel's favor all the final status issues and the huge political, military, diplomatic victory of an open alliance between Israel and the Saudis, there is, I think, unlike with the Kerry plan several years ago, there is now a huge incentive for Netanyahu, who effectively was the person that blocked the Kerry plan, there is now a huge incentive for him to embrace the Kushner plan. The other big player, the Saudis, they would get an alliance, which they have coveted, with Israel to fight the Shia axis led by Iran. It would also allow the rehabilitation of MDS after the Khashoggi affair. And if they pump in a lot of money to the West Bank, and in particular Gaza, they will get credit among the Palestinians for having financed their rehabilitation. What's the Trump administration's gain from such a plan? First of all, it will enable Trump to peel off some mega-Jewish donors and Jewish votes from the Democratic and into the Republican fold. Uh, and that would be a significant victory for Trump, especially in 2020 if Bernie gets the, Bernie Sanders gets the Democratic nomination, the possibility of winning over a significant part of the Jewish vote and large Jewish donors uh, if the plan is pushed through, I think it's a real prospect. As for Jared Kushner himself, uh, speaking realistically, his only concern is the prospect of major business deals in Saudi and the Gulf, uh, should he pull off this plan. Uh, I very much doubt he, can, he gives a darn about the fate of Israel, just as Trump is fundamentally a politician, Jared Kushner is fundamentally a businessman. And he realizes that if he can pull this off, he'll have the Saudis in his back pocket, and that means a lot of dollars in his two front pockets. Hamas, in my opinion, will formally, formally, denounce the Kushner plan, but quietly it will go along. First of all and foremost, there's the economic catastrophe in Gaza. Secondly, there's the feeling by Hamas that it was abandoned not just by the international community, but it was abandoned by the West Bank Palestinians and therefore it owes nothing to anybody and owes only to itself. And thirdly, there was the failure of the Great March to break the Israeli siege. So for those three reasons, the economic catastrophe, the abandonment by the whole of the international community, the international solidarity movement, and the West Bank Palestinians, uh, and the prospect that they will get nothing from the year and more of heroic sacrifice by the people of Gaza, it's quite likely that if there is a possibility of partially lifting the siege and massive Saudi monies, they will tacitly not explicitly, but tacitly go along with the Kushner plan. Um, that leaves 
the Palestinian Authority, which of course will formally denounce the Kushner plan as a betrayal, a two-state settlement. But as everybody in the room knows, historically it always makes noises, but still maintains what's called security co cooperation. And as always, it will claim that the people don't want the Palestinian Authority to descend, to dissolve, because if it dissolves, the West Bank will descend into anarchy. So they will use the alleged concerns of the Palestinian people to maintain power. And what's most important, they too will get Saudi money with which they can fill their front pockets, bank back pockets, and Swiss bank accounts. Dr. And there will be Dr. relatively Dr. little Dr. resistance. Dr. I'm sorry for the interruption. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so we have five minutes left. I'm sorry for yes. the Yes. Yeah, I'm done. I just uh, will leave just the... Uh, uh, okay, would you like me to stop now? No, no, we, you, ha you have five minutes uh, more. Okay, that, okay, that's perfect. I only need five more minutes. Okay. The question then is, what will be the international reactions and what are the prospects? Israel will not, excuse me, Europe will not recognize the legitimacy of the Jared plan, especially as formally the annexation will be implemented unilaterally by Netanyahu, the annexation of the major settlement blocks. Um, but that won't make much difference because Europe has never done much more than talk on this issue. For reasons which are already outlined by Moeen, the U.S. will broadly support the Jared plan across the political spectrum. First of all, because the annexation of the major settlement blocks will exclude the bulk of the Palestinian population, and therefore there will not be formally the danger of apartheid. The large number of Palestinians will be outside the annexation. The U.S. elites across the political spectrum, whether it be Dennis Ross, Martin Indyk, in the Democratic Party side, uh, and my guess probably also including Robert Malley, will support the Israeli annexation of the settlement blocks because that's always been, or I should say for the past 15 years, has been U.S. elite policy. The claim is, as it's often said, in any final agreement, Israel will annex the major settlement blocks. That's a given in all discussions in elite circles. And it will be said that, of course, in the future, during negotiations, there are possibilities for a land swap. And U.S. elites across the board will support a Israeli-Saudi alliance against what's considered the major enemy of the U.S. in the region, namely Iran. So the international reactions will be overwhelmingly either uh, irrelevant, as in Europe, or supportive as in the United States, across the political spectrum. What are the prospects of all this? Here, I, I guess I slightly disagree with Moulin, but I'm not even sure there's even a slight disagreement. As Moulin excellently pointed out, the Trump administration is an aberrant political phenomenon. And so, in my opinion, its endorsement of various Israeli annexations will probably not carry over once Trump leaves office. Because it is such an aberration, and it doesn't have any congressional or formal congressional support, I think that a lot of what Trump has done will come and go with his administration. I don't think it will have an enduring impact 
Though, as Moline pointed out, all he's done is formalize what has been what's called bipartisan policy for the last 20 or so years. But the formalization, I think, will just come and go with Trump. There will be, and we can't trivialize it, there will be a significant improvement in the quality of life of the people of Gaza. If there's even a partial lifting of the blockade and a huge inflow of money from Saudi uh, for the people of Gaza, that will be a significant improvement. And we can't ignore, I think, that fact. In the case of the West Bank, it will just be a continuation of the status quo. Uh, and uh, in many ways, the key to this plan, namely the Saudis, it will actually, because I think it's mistaken, I'll just say it in passing, I think it's mistaken to see Israel as being the major impetus behind the curve.